Happy Mother's Day. Hopefully everybody's got a great afternoon planned of serving your moms and your wives and everything like that. And uh, in honor of Mother's Day this morning, this is week number two of our Heroes series. Uh, We're going to take a look at a woman that is a prolific uh, figure out of the Old Testament. Her name is Sarah. So if you will turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, We would love to have you look there if you brought your Bible. If not, it's going to come up on the screens. Let me encourage you, though, throughout this series, uh, bring uh, your physical Bible if you have one. Now, I'm not talking about your family Bible that's on the coffee table that takes like two family members to carry. I'm talking about getting your own personal paper copy of the Bible because you can underline some things, highlight some things, write some notes in there that will really encourage you. Look with me at Hebrews chapter 11, and we're going to start reading in verse number 8. It says, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Verse number 11, it says, by faith Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Verse number 12, therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and foreigners that were exiled here on the earth. Hebrews chapter 11 is known as the hall of faith. Some of the greatest characters out of the Old Testament, Abraham and Noah and Gideon and and David and a whole bunch of others are listed there as some of the great patriarchs Heroes of the faith. What's interesting is Sarah, the wife of Abraham, is the only woman who's listed by name. Now, at the end of chapter 11, it says, in general, it's talking about women who received back their sons, their husbands from the dead. They received them back from the dead. But it doesn't list another woman specifically, but it does Sarah. And that's not because there aren't some amazing female heroes in the Old Testament that were not worthy to be included in this chapter. There are. And in fact, over the next several weeks, we're going to look at several different women as well as look at different men as heroes of the faith. But one of the reasons why it was an imperative for the writer of Hebrews to put Sarah in the story is because if Abraham is the father of our faith, which he is, I mean, if you look back, Everything that you and I have in Jesus came through the line of Abraham. But if Abraham is the father of our faith, it's absolutely essential that we include Sarah in the story because that makes her the mother of our faith. And both of their faith stories and their faith journeys are important and significant for you and I to draw from. We don't just look at Sarah's life today because it's a message to women on Mother's Day. Oftentimes, and far too often, really, we look at women out of the Bible to just give a message to women. In other words, kind of help them, okay, you're a woman, here's the story of a woman, be like her. But we don't do that with men. We, we look at all the men and we expect women to draw from the lessons of men like Abraham and Peter and Daniel and different things like that. And we say, look at that as an example. But it's kind of been looked down upon in the church to look at women as an example for men. And we need to get over that because there are some powerful, powerful, faith-filled women that God used in mighty, powerful ways. And as much as we're going to celebrate Abraham as the father of our faith, church, we're going to realize that Sarah was the mother of our faith. And there's some things for all of us to learn from out of her journey of faith. And we're going to look at her story today. Amen? 
okay, you guys are way too quiet. Do not make me come down into those aisles and preach from the middle standing on your chairs because I will. I am that pastor. So I'm, I'm going to need a little bit of feedback. Are we all in on that? Oh, whew, thank you. All right, good. It's third service. I didn't have a Red Bull. Go need your help. But it's interesting where it says in verse number eight, it says, by faith Abraham, and it talks about him believing God and going on this journey, not knowing where he was going. How many know that's a lot of our stories? Guys, we think we know where we're going, but we don't know where we're going, and that's why God gave us a wife, really. I mean, and then, you know, I think a lot of marriages have been saved by the GPS devices on our phones because now we just have another female voice telling us where to go, but she's, she, we're not married to her, so we'll listen to her voice. Abraham was married to Sarah, and it says by faith he went on a journey, but then when it gets to verse number 11 about Sarah, it says that she also by faith, she also by faith went on a journey. Believing God, that the one who promised was able to fulfill his promises. And what we see in both Abraham and in Sarah is both of them were called out by God to go on a journey. But in Sarah's case, before she could become the mother of our faith, God had to take her on a journey of faith. And he had to deal with some issues that were on the inside of her so that she would be prepared to become the mother of faith. She would give birth to the child of promise, which was Isaac. And we know that from Isaac came Jacob, and from Jacob came the 12 patriarchs that became Israel, the nation. And through the line of, of, uh, of Israel would come the Messiah, Jesus. And as Galatians says, he's the fulfillment of the promises that God made to Abraham and Sarah. You and I are literally here today in Richland, Michigan, worshiping the one true living God because a man and a woman named Abraham and Sarah believed God and went on a journey. But along their journey, God had to deal with some inconsistencies on the inside of them. He had to deal with their character. He had to deal with the issues of their faith. Because let me tell you, Abraham and Sarah did not start out as Christians. They didn't start off as God-fearers. Here's what we know about both Abraham and Sarah in their journey. That both of them had doubts, both of them had fears, and both of them struggled with the central and the major issue of their marriage and of their life, which was that they were barren. They weren't able to have children. And so, you know, history tells us and rabbinic tradition tells us about Abraham that while they lived in Ur of the Chaldees, which if you don't know where Ur is, it's modern-day Iraq, it's Babylon. They lived in this major city called Ur, and rabbinic tradition tells us that Abraham's trade that he had learned from his father was making idols. He was an idol maker. Because you see, Ur the Chaldees was not a community or a culture that worshipped one god. They were a community that worshipped a whole bunch of gods. They worshipped the sun, they worshipped the moon, they worshipped agricultural gods. And so his profession was to make idols for other people to worship, household idols. And we don't know how old they were when they got married, but they were probably very, very young when they got married. And like most young couples, they, they probably tried to have children. We know that they did because later on in their life, they looked back on that and said, we're not able to have children. And probably at some point along their marriage journey, they came to a place where they realized, we're just not going to have kids. You know, in that culture, that was a very, very stigmatic thing to happen in your life because today we realize why physiologically some people can't have a difficult time having children and conceiving and those kinds of things. But back then they didn't believe that. They believed that when God was happy with you, he gave you kids. And when God was angry with you, he took away the ability. So they, they grew up as idol makers. Think about the irony, making gods for other people, but the very gods like the God of fertility that he would make for other people was the God that they believed was actually withholding children from them. And so for Abraham and Sarah, the gods would have been a means to an end, but there would not have been a close relationship with them. And they're now in their 50s and their 60s. And, and on one particular day, the God of Genesis chapter one who created the heavens and the earth. The God who revealed himself to Noah is now the God, the one true, the living God. The other ones were just idols. He was the one true living God. He speaks to Abraham. His name was Abram at that time, which means exalted father. 
And he reveals himself to this man that he found in Ur the Chaldees. And he says to him, Abram, or it might have sounded more like Abraham. I don't know how it sounded, but it was a, probably a very godlike voice, right? I mean, Abraham. And he tells him, he says, I'm going to bless you, Abraham. I'm going to bless you. And not only am I going to bless you, but I'm going to give you children more than the stars of the sky and more than the sand on the seashore. And through your family and your descendants, I'm going to bless all the other families of the earth. What God was really saying, if you listen closely, was God was saying, I'm about to use you to partner with me to change the course of history, Abraham. And in order for me to do that, I need you to pack up everything that you own. I need you to shut down your business. I need you to say goodbye to your family for the last time. And I need you to go on a journey. I'll tell you when we get there, but get your wife, get your family, and go. And Imagine what that must have been like as an older man who's very wealthy, he's established in his business, never been able to have children, and now not only does some God speak to you, you've never been close to the gods, but now the one true living creator God says your name and tells you that he's going to bless you and he's going to give you children. Not just one or two. We're talking like a fleet of buses. We're not talking about 15 passenger van full of kids. We're talking about fleet and fleet of Greyhound buses. Can you imagine everywhere that you go, kids and children and, and a lineage that's following behind you. And he says, and I'm going to use you and the family and the children that I give you is going to change the course of history. Now that would have been amazing. But how many know that Abraham's faith was great? But I believe Sarah's faith was actually greater, and here's why. Because Abraham had an encounter with God in hearing his voice. How many think if God spoke to you the way that oftentimes we want God to speak to us, how many think it would be easier to believe? A little bit. Like if right now, if we just, how, has anybody in here ever prayed, God, if you're real, speak to me? Anybody ever prayed that before? I mean, you can raise your hands. I have. I've, like, God, I would really like to hear that. Um, but here's the thing. Abraham did have that. Sarah didn't. All Sarah got was Abraham walking in one day. Hey, baby, guess what happened at work today? What? What would you do? God spoke to me. I heard God's voice. Which one? No, none of those. An invisible God. The God who is, he says he's the one true living God. That all these other things are idols. And he's the one true living God. Really? What did he say to you? Well, he said, um... Well, um, what he said was that um, he's going to bless us. Oh, that's great. Well, and he's going to bless our children. We don't have any, Abraham. Well, he, that's the thing is he says we're going to have a lot of kids. And he's going to bless not only us, but he's going to bless our kids and our grandkids and our descendants after us, and he's going to use our kids and our family to change the world. All he asks us to do is to believe him, and so we need to pack all our stuff up. We're shutting the business down. We're following him. We're going on a road trip. He says he's going to give us a piece of land. That's where he's going to establish us. Where is this place? I don't know. I'll know it when we get there. How many have heard that before? <laughs> I'll know it when we get there. How many have ever gone on a camping trip? We'll know it when we get there. So imagine being Sarah that day when Abraham comes home and says, God spoke to me, we're going to have kids pack the bags. How many know it took amazing faith for Abraham to believe God, but it took even greater faith for Sarah to believe Abraham? But she did. And so they packed up everything that they owned. We have a map up here on the screen that they'll put up that will show you the journey that Abraham and Sarah took. They started in Ur of the Chaldees. And they began to work their way up to a city called Haran. And Haran was actually the name of Abraham's brother who died in this city. And then from Haran, in response to the voice of God, they went on a journey down into the Canaan land. Into the land that you and I now know as Israel that would become the nation of Israel. But as they came into the land, their living in tents and they're living in transition, and they're believing God. That's what faith is. They're believing God, believing in the promises of God, but they're actually on a journey of trying to discover 
the place that God was going to bless them, but even greater than just the journey of finding the place, they were on a journey to discover who God was. Because when they got down into Canaan, things got bad, they go into Egypt. Egypt at that time was kind of like the New York City. When they go in, here, here's a little something, I mean, talk about the humanity of Abraham. He says to Sarah, he says, hey, Sarah, you're, you're really good looking. She's 65, 70 years old. And what rabbis say, looking back on Sarah, the tradition is that Sarah was the most beautiful woman who ever lived, besides Eve. And so imagine, she must have been good looking at 65, 70 years old, because Abraham says, hey, if Pharaoh sees you, he's going to want you for himself. So if he asks, I don't want him to kill me to get you, so tell him you're my sister. At that point, most good wives would be like, excuse me, not going to do that. But she goes along with it. She lies. Pharaoh takes her into the harem. God threatens to kill Pharaoh. Pharaoh wakes up and says, I don't know why you lied to me. Take your wife back. And he takes his wife and they send him out of Egypt and they go back on a journey back up into the promised land. So they're, they're on this journey. Their biggest issue in their marriage and now on their journey of faith is their inability to conceive. But it's not what you think. You see, oftentimes we read the story of Abraham and Sarah, and we think that the biggest issue that they had was their inability to conceive a child. But the word conceive actually has a second definition, and Webster says it like this. Conceive means to take into one's mind and to apprehend by reason, imagination, or understanding. See, some things that God speaks to us and calls us to believe by faith are inconceivable. That's inconceivable. It's inconceivable. Come on, nobody watches movies? The Princess Bride? I don't think that means what you think it means. It's, it's inconceivable. Some things are that God speaks to us seem to be inconceivable. And the word inconceivable means we don't have the ability to understand it, to comprehend it, to wrap our mind around it, to grab it by reason. Our imagination's not big enough. And our understanding about the how and the why and the why, it's just, it's mind-blowing. And so while Abraham and Sarah struggled with having children, their real issue was they had a really difficult time wrapping their mind around how God is going to fulfill his promise because after all, we're way beyond the age of childbirth. So now God takes them on a journey, but it's not just a physical journey, it's a journey of faith. And a journey of faith, what you need to know about a journey of faith is while they were traveling all these miles and living in tents, a spiritual journey or a journey of faith is a journey not just of distance, or of time, but it's actually a, a journey of the soul. And that was the greater journey. It was a journey in which God was helping to reveal himself so that they could discover who God really was and who they were called to be beyond everything that was implausible, beyond everything that was difficult to believe and didn't seem probable in their life. God was like, I want to show you that I'm the God of the impossible, that I am a God who fulfills my promises. And it's, you don't just have to live by the practical. You don't just have to accept what's come your way. I am the God that when God steps into a situation, he changes everything. He suspends laws. He steps over boundaries because he's the maker and the crafter and everything that exists is held together by his words. And one word from God can change all of the circumstances in our life. You and I as followers of Jesus Christ, we're on a journey of our own. We're on a journey of faith. Our journey is different than Abraham and Sarah. We're not traveling around in tents. How many have ever gone camping before? Like I'm talking about hands down. Camping in tents before, raise your hand, because campers don't count, okay? Jim Gaffigan, the comedian, says, camping is God's gift to us to remind us of why we have homes, and I believe that to be true. You see, Sarah and Abraham spent years, decades traveling on this journey of faith, trying to find the land that God was going to give them to establish them. Decades in tents in their 70s and 80s. If you've ever gone camping in tents, you know it's, it's in my opinion, it's the most miserable thing that you can do. I am not a camper for me is the Marriott. 
JW Marriott. Let's, it's like, I want room service. I want plush pillow. That's camping to me. And if you say, I've had people say to me, oh, Pastor Lee, you just haven't tried camping. You just got to go. No, I've tried camping. Jane and I tried camping earlier in marriage. It's like, we need something to do. Family traditions that's cheap. How many know when you're first married, cheap is the criteria? And it's like, what's cheap? I'll tell you what, let's, let's get thin pieces of nylon held together by string and wooden stakes. Let's go out into the woods and let's live like our ancestors did for a couple days and see if we like it. We no longer camp. We went out and we bought the tents, we bought the sleeping bags, the little air mattresses, you know, that inflate, they're about this thin, and really all they are is styrofoam out of thrown away refrigerator boxes, and, and we had good friends, the bets that said, hey, let's go camping together, so all, all of our kids were little, so we decided to go camping at this place just over the Indiana border. I think it was like a Yogi Bear uh, campground. And so we let Ann Betts pick out the campground, and she's like, oh, let's do it right next to the woods. Little did she know it was a, a, a mosquito farm next to the, it was a swamp where they like raise mosquitoes. And I'm not talking about these little mosquitoes. I'm talking about prehistoric pterodactyl knitting needle. Rawr! It was like right out of Lord of the Rings and coming out of the swamp at us. And so we drive down there, we set up our tents, we set up our kids' tents, air mattresses, and 10 minutes after we set everything up, storm clouds start rolling in. I'm trying to cook under a screen, you know, little tent that's got screen doors, and I'm trying to cook, and I burn my hand on the thing, I fling the steak across the campsite, I'm mad. I, here's how long ago it was. I pull out my Blackberry. Anybody remember those? And I'm scrolling online to look at the Doppler radar. And you know when it's red and a thunderstorm has red, high winds and heavy rains? That was coming right over us. It was like Bozo's nose coming right over us. And it just rained all night long. It was just terrible. Our kids were like floating away on their air mattresses. So early in the morning, it's like, let's go home. We're an hour and a half away. Let's go home. And we packed everything up and we said, we'll go home. We'll dry off. We'll come back. So... We got home. By the time we got back to Kalamazoo, it was sunny out. I'm like, oh, okay. So we decided to go to B&B Discount. We bought some tarps. We're going to go back. We're going to put tarps over our tent. We had fans, extension cords. We're going to plug them in. We're going to have fans. And, uh, and we got some extra food. We dried off all our clothes. And so about 4 o'clock, we said, all right, let's go back. So we go back to the camp. And as we are pulling into the campground, I swear there was black clouds following us. <laughs> like, oh, you're back, let's go. All right, so the clouds came and within 10 minutes began to deluge us again. The guy at the campground, oh, it's been sunny all day, I don't know what's going on. And we put tarps over our tents, I had a fan in there, I was reading a book by an atheist called God is Not Good, I almost became an atheist <laughs> that night. And the next morning, we just, we took everything, we wadded, we almost left it there. We wadded it up, threw it in our garage wet, and the next garage sale, I think I sold everything for like $5. <laughs> Pass on my problems. <laughs> Tents are not comfort. And so we don't camp anymore. That was two days. Imagine decades. Imagine Sarah looking at Abraham going, when are we getting there? You said... And when are we going to have children? You said. But before she could become the mother of faith, she had to go on a journey of faith. A journey of discovering who God was. It was really a journey of the soul. In Genesis 17, God shows up and he says something to Abraham about Sarah, who's been struggling like any of us would at, in the early stages of this journey. Her name originally was Sarai, not Sarah. Just like Abraham's name was originally Abram. And now God shows up and he says to Abram, I'm about to escalate things and so I'm going to change your name. It's no longer going to be Abram, which means exalted father, but it's now going to be Abraham, which means father of a multitude. Imagine that's your name and you have no children. Every time that you go into, hey, what's your name? Ah, oh, father of a multitude. How many kids do you have? None. And God shows up and he says to Abraham, I'm going to change your name. But then in verse 15 of Genesis 17, he also says to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, 
You shall not call her Sarah any longer, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her. Think about that. God's saying, I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her, and I will bless her. And listen to this next part. She shall become nations. Wow. Because kings shall come from her. Because kings, she's not just going to have kids. She's going to have kings. God says to Abraham, he says, I want, you to, I want you to know, and I want Sarah to know. Her name is no longer Sarai. Her name is now Sarah. Because Abraham, I changed your name. Your name meant exalted father, but now it's father of a multitude. I'm ramping things up. And in the same way, your partner on this faith journey, I want her to have a change in identity. Because you need to understand what her name originally meant. Sarai meant argumentative and quarrelsome. (laughs) On a long road trip where the husband doesn't know where he's going to go because he heard from God. He's got a wife whose name is argumentative (laughs) and quarrelsome. (laughs) It's funny to me. (laughs) But God says, I'm changing her name and I'm changing it to Sarah. Well, what does Sarah mean? It means princess. So here's what I want you to get. Sarai, quarrelsome, argumentative, became a limitation in her journey of faith because her quarrels and her arguments weren't with Abraham. They were with God. And God's saying, I'm now changing your identity Because I no longer want you to be identified with your internal arguments and your quarrels with me. I want you to now understand that your identity is shaped by what I think about you. And even though I know that you don't understand my ways, even though I know that it feels like it's been a journey, even though I know you've experienced disappointment and fear and doubt and all of those arguments, because by the way, those are our same arguments. God is saying, that's not, I don't see you. I don't define you by your arguments. I don't define you by your weakness. That's not who you are. You want to know who you are, Sarah, to me? You're my princess. You know, that's what every little girl wants their dad to say. You're my princess. And it was God speaking softly to his daughter, who was in the middle of a journey, who had experienced internal battles, arguments. You don't think that she struggled with With fear, God, where are you? You forgot me. When her sisters and everybody else experienced conceiving and bringing forth a child, she was left behind. You don't think she experienced disappointment? You don't think that there were fears? Or how about some doubts and some unbelief? And to hear God say over her, I know your battles, I know your struggles, but that's not who you are. See, it doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman. It doesn't matter if you're named Sarah or not. All of us in our faith journeys, we have our arguments with God. We have our quarrels with God's purposes in his plans. We have our fears and we have our doubts. But God has to step in. We have, to, we have to allow God to win the battle of our quarrels and our identity and actually get us to understand that how he sees us, in spite of what we've experienced, how he sees us is he doesn't see us through the lens of our weakness or our inability or any of those things. He sees us as sons and daughters, as princes and princesses. Every woman in this room, you need to understand you're not just your dad's princess, you're God the Father is speaking over your life that you're his princess. And he values you, he treasures you, he loves you. Every young man and every man in this room, even every father and grandfather, doesn't matter how old you are, you need to hear that God the Father says over you, you're a prince, you were made for more. You were not, see a prince from the moment he is born realizes that his role in life is to reign, not to be conquered. We live in a world that tries to use your internal battles against you to bring you into subjection and under the mastery of your appetites and culture and this world's viewpoint of manhood. 
God says you weren't created to be dominated. You were created to bend your knee to one name, and that's the name of Jesus. And then from that point, to sit on thrones and reign and rule. You were created to be a legacy builder. Every man and every woman in this room is a child of God. You are a prince and a princess. We can no longer surrender to the arguments that limit our ability to conceive the purposes that God has for us. Because if you're waiting for your logic and your rationalism to catch up with what you will allow God to do in your life, you will live a pragmatic life of emptiness because you will never see the supernatural in your life. The supernatural promises of God are always after an invitation for you and I to step into the realm of the improbable and the implausible. That's how we receive things from God. You were created to walk by faith, just like Abraham and Sarah. And it's in this arena that God deals with our arguments. That's what God was doing all these years. Why did it take so long for Abraham and Sarah? Well, it's because God had to deal with their hearts. And he had to get them to the point where they would believe. See, there was this one day in Genesis 18, actually, where God shows up and takes a theophonic form. In other words, God takes a physical form like a man, and he comes and he sits and he has a conversation with Abraham. And he says, where's Sarah? And, oh, she's over there. And I think she's probably disappointed. I think she's trying to figure things out. And the Lord says to Abraham, he says, well, he says, this time next year, you're going to have your son. This time next year. And here's what the Bible says. It says, Sarah was listening. How many of you know every mom, every woman has high-level Spider-Man surveillance skills of listening? They hear, like through 14 floors of cement floors and CIA blocking devices, they can hear. Sarah's in the next tent over, and she hears God say to Abraham, this, about this time next year when I come back, you will have a child. And it says, Sarah laughed. <laughs> and God says, why did Sarah laugh? And, here, and by the way, when God asks questions, it's not because he's looking for information. Why did Sarah laugh? Sarah's answer, oh, I didn't laugh. <laughs> I didn't laugh. And here, here was God's answer. He says, well, about this time next year, you will have a child. You'll have a son. And by the way, Sarah, you did laugh. <laughs> you laughed. How many know you shouldn't lie to God? I mean, he's, he's God. It's like, oh, I didn't laugh. No, you laughed. It's like your kids saying, I didn't eat the chocolate bar while they got melted chocolate all over their hands. It's like, of course you did. Sarah, you laughed. About this time next year, you see, that's what hope says. Jesus is hope personified. And what God says over you is he says, doesn't matter your disappointments, doesn't matter your fears, doesn't matter your logic and your rationalism, any of your arguments and your quarrels, that's not what I see over you. My purpose is going to come to pass because we need to understand that in the journey of faith, listen, the destination is not the destination. The destination, I'm going to say it again, is not the destination. Well, what does that mean? Why are we on a trip if we're not going someplace? You and I live in a world where we are so captivated by three dimensions of time, space, and matter, and things that we can see around us. We live in an achievement, consumeristic culture, and we are saturated with this in our thinking. All of us, it's all about succeeding. It's all about achieving, getting someplace, climbing the corporate ladder, you know, whatever it is, we, we want people to know us. We want to be successful. We want to buy something. We want to gain something. We're saving up for a trip and going someplace. We want to go someplace in life so that at the end of it, we feel like our life has been a success. We're so busy getting caught up in going someplace, a destination, that we don't realize that the destination isn't really the destination. Because through God's eyes, it's not about where you end up. It's about who you end up as. It's about who you are, not what you hold. It's about who he shapes you to become, not where you're able to land. That's the destination. There's this part of this scripture that we just read earlier, verse 13 of Hebrews 11, that has bothered me for years. I've read the Bible, I can't tell you how many times, but every time I've read Hebrews 11, I love it until I get to verse 13. 
And it's because of what it says. It says, these all, talking about all these heroes of the faith, it says, these all died in faith. Listen to this next part. Not having received the promises. But having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. These all died in faith. Not having received the promise. That doesn't make sense to me. Because you see, what we're taught is that if we have enough faith, then we'll receive the promises. If we have enough faith, we can change things. If our faith is true and strong, then we can use our faith to get what we want. And that's an American version. It's a faulty version of a relationship with God because Abraham and Sarah were people of great faith. But they didn't inherit the promises. Well, how can that be success? It's because of two reasons. Number one, it's because along the journey, even though they never possessed the promised land, their descendants did. And the reason why their descendants did is because of the second reason, is because they became who God designed them to be. They became, they were conformed into the patriarch, the heroes, Abraham and Sarah. That here we are thousands of years later, and you and I are their spiritual descendants. You see, because Abraham and Sarah, about a year later, because they didn't grow weary and because they didn't let down their guard and they kept their eyes and trusted the one who could build their lives and would build the city, they actually gave birth to a son, just like God had promised. Isn't that amazing? And they named him Isaac. Do you know Isaac means son of laughter? A lot of times people think, well, of course they named him Isaac. They were so overjoyed that after all these years, they actually had a son. They just couldn't laugh. It was like tears of joy and laughter. Well, that's probably part of it. But I think the reason why they named him Isaac is it was God's way of saying, I always get the last laugh. Tell me what I can't do. Is anything too difficult for me? God could have given them a child on day one. But he chose to allow them to go through the process so that at the end they would not only have the promise, but they would have been conformed into the image that God had always designed for them. You see, there was another woman of faith whose husband was a trailblazer of leading people into the promised land, and he never saw the promised land the way that he envisioned it. His name was Martin Luther King Jr. He said, I've been on the mountain and I've seen the promised land. I might not get into it, and he didn't. He was assassinated. Great mover, great thinker, great prophetic leader in our nation for civil rights, but his widow, Coretta Scott King, his Sarah, said this about her life and her story. Listen to these words. She said, my story is a freedom song from within my soul. My life has been a guide to discovery, a vision of how even the worst pain and heartaches can actually be channeled into human monuments, impenetrable and everlasting. Here's what she said. She goes, my journey has been a painful one, but I've come to realize it's been a discovery of the power of God to use our journey to change the course of history. And that's what God did with Abraham and Sarah. Because from Abraham and Sarah came Isaac, and from Isaac came Jacob. Jacob had 12. The 12, one of the 12 was a man named Judah. Judah had a family line, and some 15 generations later, his descendant was born to a carpenter and his betrothed virgin wife named Mary, and the son's name was Jesus. And Jesus was the fulfillment of the promise that God had made all the way back to Abraham and Sarah when it was impossible for them to have kids. And when the Bible says that even though they didn't receive the promise, they saw it from afar and they rejoiced. I want you to know Abraham and Sarah knew that God ultimately was going to fulfill his promises. And one day when Jesus Christ stepped onto the 
pavement of the Temple Mount, the Lord suddenly returned to his temple. And about 30 years later, when his hands were nailed into the crossbeams and he was elevated, suspended between heaven and earth, dying for the sins of the world, God in heaven had fulfilled his promise. And Abraham and Sarah were there watching it and saying, God, you are so faithful. You have changed the world and you did it through us. And really all you asked us to do was to believe you. Can I just tell you, God wants to change the world through you. It's not about what you do. It's not about where you end up. It's about your ability to believe him. Abraham is our father of faith. Sarah is our mother of faith. But you're called to be a father and a mother of faith to those that are around you as well. Would you stand up with me? All of us are on a journey of faith. All of us are on a journey of faith. And my prayer this morning is that God would win the battle of our arguments, that God would win the battle for our faith and our trust. We would no longer begin to see ourselves through the lens of our fears, our doubts, our disappointments, even our own design and our own plans. It says that Abraham was looking for the city whose designer and builder was God. Do you know that your life is a city and you can either design it or you can let God design it? You can build your own life or you can let God build your life. If you'll let God design it and build it, he will fulfill his promise every single time. Would you bow your heads with me all over the room? I'm gonna invite our prayer team, care ministers, if they would come and make their way up along the front tonight, today. Father, today, we look at the example of Sarah and her husband, Abraham, and we live in the aftermath. And what was their faith has now become our sight. I pray on the inside of everyone, you would call forth, you would call forth the man and the woman of faith so that someday our faith will become our children and our grandchildren's sight. That just like you blessed this infertile couple and gave them countless descendants in the spirit, that each and every one of us would be used to impact the world because we believed you. That we would become everything that you have called us to be. Help us to believe. Help us to overlook our limitations. Help us to have so much more trust in who you are beyond the things that we think we are. And today, before we dismiss, I'm just gonna invite you that you may be here today and you relate to this story. Maybe it's in a physical way. I just feel like maybe there's even some people that even physically are struggling with infertility. I want you to know even on this Mother's Day that the Father, He loves you so much. It's not because you've done anything wrong. You've been on a journey just feel the tenderness of the Lord just wanting to say this. You don't have to hide your heart from him. And if there's been a physical struggle with infertility and inability to conceive, we're just going to invite you to come in just a moment when we dismiss and receive prayer because we believe God's a God of miracles. We want to join our faith and just pray and release God's blessing over you. You may be here today and it's not a physical ability to conceive, but you've had a difficult time in your heart of conceiving and believing God, believing God's word, believing his promises over your life because you can't see it and you can't test it or because you've been disappointed, you've been waiting. Today I'm, I'm praying that God would just release greater faith in our hearts. And after I pray and we dismiss, if you need prayer for anything, you're going through a battle, you're going through an argument, you're going through a, a wrestling match with God, or you need God to move on your behalf, today, I want you to take a step of faith, just like they did, stepping over the city limits of what was familiar on a journey of faith. I'm gonna invite many of you to journey down to the front and to receive prayer with these prayer partners and believe God that he, he's gonna win the argument and win the, the quarrel and change our identities to see ourselves differently so that when we leave today, we leave 
with the favor and the grace of God upon our lives. Lord, today, bless us. Bless us indeed. And expand our hearts to see how beautiful, how powerful, how strong, and how for us you truly are. Lord, help us to walk in our true identity. Meet us as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. Please come forward if you would like prayer this morning. We'll see you next weekend.